Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me back again. It's a real pleasure to be here as ever. Um, as ever as well, I'm come wearing a couple of hats today. So I just wanted to start off actually by talking quickly about the Royal Archaeological Institute, uh, who are kindly uh, co-sponsoring today. If you are not a member, as Elliot said, do please consider joining. It is a, a wonderful institution. Um, they offer full membership, for which you get all of these fantastic things, including access to the Society of Antiquaries Library, which is a, a major bonus. Um, and it is also a very old and venerable society. So while we may be here today celebrating 10 years of TDP, next year uh, the Royal Archaeological Institute will be celebrating 175 years uh, in operation. So the granddaddy of, of them all. Um, the very first, well, one of the very, no, it was the very first meeting of the Royal Archaeological Institute and the British Archaeological Association was at uh, none other place than Canterbury Cathedral. So uh, keep an eye out for some special things hopefully coming up next year uh, with the RAI. So, um, moving on to talk about Thames Discovery Programme. Um, where to start, really? Uh, well, it's... <laughs> I thought we'd have a whole lecture on shopping trolleys, all right? <laughs> I've got half an hour, so I figure half an hour on shopping trolleys. Be, yeah, we're fine with that. No, maybe not. Um, but it's 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 such a, a it's such an incredible project. Where do I start? What should I talk about? Um, should I talk about some of the incredible discoveries that have been made throughout the ten years of this uh, project? So here we're looking at. Vauxhall um, and the discovery of the Mesolithic features on the foreshore in the shadow of MI6 there. Um, should we talk about that? Pretty exciting. Or should we talk about fish traps? <laughs> Can I talk about fish traps for half an hour? Would that be all right? If you do know how I like a fish trap, fish trap, <laughs> trolleys, all of those things. Um, this is one of the Anglo-Saxon fish traps at Chelsea, um, probably our best surviving example. Um, but I thought, no, I won't, I won't talk about fish traps today. We've already heard about the stunning discoveries at Greenwich. So this is a picture from uh, 2016 of the Tudor or Stuart uh, jetty structure at Greenwich, just again demonstrating the incredible erosion that has uh, it's, sort of happened at this site over the last 10 years and the incredible changes that we've seen, features that have literally come and gone over this 10 year period. Um, we could talk about Charlton uh, yes. <laughs> and the castle ship breaking yard, um, always a fascinating subject, the remains of huge vessels broken up on the foreshore, expertly uh, cleaned and recorded and researched and interpreted, an incredible story. I thought, no, I won't, I won't talk about that. We'll leave Elliot to talk about uh, Castle's Shipbreaking Yard. Or we could talk about the work that we've undertaken on really iconic uh, sites like the Tower of London, for sure. Again, a site where we've got incredible uh, dynamic erosion going on, lots of changes, and the parts of the site that we've been working on in the past, obviously, you can, uh, again, no longer accessible. So they have been covered up by uh, modern consolidation to protect the river wall. So I thought about talking about some of our amazing discoveries, and then I thought, no, actually, I'll talk about something else. So I thought, well, should I talk about all of the events and the activities and the outreach and the thousands and thousands of Londoners that we've spoken to over the last 10 years? So here you can see Helen uh, in action on the Tower of London again on one of our foreshore open days. Josh down on the uh, Bankside Beach uh, with a a group of all ages there, talking them through what they're discovering on the foreshore. And last year at uh, Putney, so a big event, um, working with our frog teams to talk to visitors, um, and again, working with young people to explore uh, the excitements of the foreshore at Putney. So I thought, well, I could talk about events and activities. And then I thought, no, what else can I talk about? Uh, can we talk about TDP on TV? That's pretty exciting. We've been on TV a, a lot, actually. Um, this is us down on the foreshore in Greenwich in uh, 2010, photographed by uh, one of our frog members, Joe Warren, um, filming for what was the very first series of Digging for Britain. So we've been around a long time. We're on the first series. 
And in the middle there, we've got a picture of Graham Kendler, now very sadly missed colleague from uh, Museum of London Archaeology, and a, a huge expert on finds of all kinds. We could talk about being on time team. Um, one of the first, we were on one of the first episodes of Digging for Britain. We were on one of the last episodes of Time Team. Let's not make a correlation there that we were on one of the last <laughs> episodes of Time Team. But here's a, a beautiful photograph by uh, Rose Bailey of filming at Charlton for Time Team, uh, the Time Team special, this one was, I believe, in 2011. So here's the team hard at work uh, and being recorded in their, uh, their efforts. Should we talk about awards? We should. Um, this remains one of my favourite ever photos that I took, actually, on the Tens Porter Shore, because somehow I managed to get a little glinting spot <laughs> on the award. Now, TDP is an, is an award-winning uh, project. 2010, we won the award for the best representation of archaeology in the media for our website, which is remarkably unchanged since 2010 actually so I like to think it is still award-winning. Uh, in 2012 we won the best uh, community archaeology project and of course on Monday we are up for uh, best archaeological project for this year. We are one of only two projects that have been shortlisted this year so we have a pretty good chance uh, of winning the award, so we'll keep you posted uh, live from the British Archaeological Awards, just like the Oscars, honest, it's just like that. Um, so I thought about all these things and I thought, well, I could talk about them all, and actually I've managed to talk about some of them in a kind of highlighted way, but I thought, well, what else, what else could I talk about, uh, given that I am a, a speaker without portfolio? Um, I haven't had to provide an abstract, I could say anything, literally anything. Um, so actually what I thought I'd talk about was our uh, photographic archive. I thought I'd talk about the Flickr um, site. So Flickr is where we archive all of our photographs. It is a publicly accessible online archive of um, nearly four and a half thousand images now. And it too is 10 years old this year. So it has been with us since the beginning of the project and I hope it will, will carry on um, being used. You can look at photographs in a, a sort of stream, so you can look at them as they were taken. You can look at them in albums or sets. You can look at them by collections of key sites or by borough. You can look for them on a map or you can search for them using tags, so the, the way that the photos are labelled. So fish trap, for example, you can put that in as a search term and it will bring back pictures of fish traps. Now. I hope it's a, it's a usable and useful uh, archive. What we do know is that a lot of people are looking at it. So as of uh, Friday, when I, Friday, Thursday, yesterday, <laughs> yesterday, oh yeah, it's only Saturday. Um, as of uh, the day before yesterday, when I was putting this PowerPoint together, we had had 1.544735 million views of these images on Flickr, which is, amazing, which does suggest, hopefully, that people are visiting this site to look at uh, our photographic records. Um, obviously, particularly useful when you're talking about things like erosion, and I'll come on to that. So what I thought I'd do um, is a little bit of a top of the pops style uh, <laughs> countdown of the top 10 viewed photos, most viewed photos, on Flickr. So that's what we're going to do. So here we go. At number 10 is this. Um, now I should add that number, the, the bottom of the, the top 10 chart is a very dynamic place. It changes around very quickly down there. So, you know, things coming up, things going down, the hits are being made. Ben Lewis, you need to not be in my slide. Sorry, Ben Lewis. So. This is one of the older, obviously oldest pictures in our uh, online archive, and this is a photograph um, by Gus from April 1977. So this is one of the first sort of foreshore explorations um, by, by our leader. Um, underneath Southwark Bridge, we are here. So just hold that picture in your mind, and we jump forward to 2016. So, 
I'm slightly nearer in, um, but immediately you can see the sort of dramatic changes over the last 40 years. And really, I hope, as I mentioned earlier, demonstrating the, the enormous value of these monitoring images, going back, trying to stand in the same place if you can, taking the same photo time and again to look at how the foreshore is changing. So just to, we're just going to flick back and forwards between these pictures to have a quick look. So looking back here, the first thing that strikes me is that revetment line at the front um, where we've lost a lot of the horizontal uh, timbers there. I'm standing in a slightly different place so we can see more behind, but it does look like a lot of the material on the barge bed side built up behind this uh, revetment area has gone because uh, we are seeing other things now, structures popping up behind. Um, another thing to notice is the, the change in the waterfront buildings. So the only thing that's almost the same in both images is the bridge itself. We've got a lot of new buildings. We've got um, expansion out into the foreshore area there. Um, so it's a really incredible amount of change recorded there over the last 40 years. So that is number 10. Also, I have no idea, by the way, what the time is. So if anyone, I'm just going to carry on talking until someone waves at me. All right, lovely. Okay, so moving on to number nine, which is this one. So this is a picture of uh, our frogs, and you can see Martin um, in the front there. This is from September 2014 and is one of the Tower of London open foreshore days. So the frog are standing downstream of a barrier that was in place in order to protect part of the site from visitors. It's the part of the site that we were recording in detail with the Society for Thames Mudlarks and uh, the Portable Antiquities Scheme. And also the site where actually the foreshore narrows quite considerably um, and it's not a great idea to have loads of people congregating at that end when you have hundreds of people down on the foreshore. So the frog are here um, engaging with members of the public, discussing the archaeology, looking at what people have discovered, um, and talking to them about why we have a barrier uh, in place on the foreshore. So each time I, f I got to one of these uh, countdown figures or <coughs> countdown images, I thought I, it, it sort of prompted me to go off and explore what else was in that set or what other things were associated with that image. So in that set um, was this image as well. So this is one of the finds that was made during the open foreshore weekend. It's a tiny, tiny little stoneware uh, pot or a little tankard jug of some sort found by a member of the public. So presumably a child's toy. Um, it, I can't think anything else it would be useful for. Um, and it is, of course, just one of a number of incredible wonderful artefacts that have been found on the Thames foreshore at the Tower of London, um, both by the Society of Thames Mudlarks, the Thames and Field Metal Detecting Society, members of the public. Um, so we have a whole array of Roman artefacts here. So a group of coins, which actually were all found on the same uh, day in 2011. Uh, a Roman oil lamp, which if a memory serves, was found by a child uh, during one of the uh, open foreshore days wonderful medieval artifacts as well. So we've got a, a medieval 12th century bone buckle uh, resting in Mark Jennings' hand there. Uh, and a, uh, a, what I, th I thought at first was a, a pilgrim token, but actually turns out to be a beer token, um, John Clark tells me, 13th century, again, uh, found on the Tower Up Beach. So, number eight. Um, Number eight and number seven, actually, which we'll come on to in a moment, are again two photos from the 1977 uh, foreshore exploration. Um, this one is uh, on the original card, is titled Under Southwark Bridge, the Remains of Three Cranes Wharf? Question um, mark. This is a feature that, to my knowledge, is no longer there. So again, capturing this data, it may be, the when you take the photograph, it may be the only time you see a feature. Um, this probably didn't wash out overnight, but it certainly has disappeared or been covered up in the last 40 years. Similarly, number seven, um, these are the stairs at Cousin Lane. Now, the stairs are still there, but the structure is completely different. So these stairs were removed some point 
post-2000, I think, or 1998, um, and have been replaced by a set of modern stairs. So these images and the ones in the Thames Archaeological Survey archive are the only ones that we, we now have a record of what was uh, there before. So three of the 1977 uh, images so far in our top ten. City of London, uh, we've already heard about this morning from uh, Melvin's talk, uh, and the, the images that uh, have been produced of that, that area. Um, the sort of dynamism of that site has been demonstrated as well by Elliot's talk, and the, the sort of rapid erosion and the rapid change. And of course this site, we now have a completely new uh, feature to monitor. So because the erosion again has been so severe, like at Greenwich, like at the Tower of London, um, but even more substantial, actually. This is probably the most substantial bit of foreshore reconstruction that we've seen so far. We have an entirely new uh, revetment and barge bed constructed um, along property boundaries as well, which is fascinating. So it doesn't actually extend into an area where we've got <coughs> continuing um, erosion. They've stopped where the property boundary is. So it'll be interesting to see how it erodes around this brand new uh, structure over the next few years. Number six. I can't actually remember what number six is now, so it's quite exciting, this countdown for me as well. <laughs> oh, it's this? Oh, it's graffiti. Yeah. So uh, rather pleased to see graffiti making an appearance uh, in our top ten. Again, a find from uh, the Tower of London. This is on the wall. Um, just near a set of stairs, as you come down the stairs um, underneath the Tower Wharf, there is a stone covered in uh, people's names. Now, I don't know who any of these people are. Um, they could be, it could be children visiting, it could be adults visiting, but someone has decided, or a group of people, probably at different times, have decided to leave uh, their mark on the wall. Now, graffiti and uh, marks on, on, on walls or stones in our environment are very interesting. Sometimes they are uh, very ephemeral, they're not going to last very long, um, but they are expressing some very sort of deep and powerful emotions here. This, this declaration of love, and it wasn't my children, um, <laughs> on the foreshore here uh, in Greenwich, um, but that won't, you know, that won't survive for very long. So again, is this something that we could be thinking about making a record of? Um, and, you know, so they are expressions, they are uh, a commentary almost. So maybe this is something else that we could be looking at recording, especially as they may not last for very long. Um, another kind of mark, um, Elliot's already referred to sort of potential uh, witch marks this morning, but Mason's marks as well may prove to be another interesting area of study if we're finding those on both in situ and ex situ uh, stones. So this is from the Tower of London and this one is from Greenwich. So we haven't got a lot of examples of those recorded so far. It's about 15 or so that come up when you search in Flickr for Mason's marks, but it might be another sort of, it may just be that we haven't tagged them or labelled them correctly in the archive. Um, it may be proved to be an interesting sort of source of study in the, in the future, a research topic. Right, number five. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, so this is our only, interestingly, artifact photograph, fa photograph in the top ten. So of all of the photos, um, most of them are structures, as we've seen so far, and people. Um, which is fascinating because obviously our project is focused around structures. So it's fascinating that Really, we, don't, we are seeing that reflected in what people are looking at in our archive. The, the artifact photos are popular, but they're not the main thing in the top 10 that people are looking at. This one, however, is at number five. So this is a key uh, found on the foreshore in Westminster. And I have a feeling that the, the caption for the photo says something like, the key to the Houses of Parliament, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Which might, be, might explain why it's, it's been well uh, viewed. But it was found on the foreshore just in front of uh, the Houses of Parliament, so you know, who knows. Um, while thinking about this image, I thought, well, what, what were we doing there at the Houses of Parliament in August 2013? What sort of things were we uh, looking at? Um, we had glorious uh, weather for that uh, period of survey. We had a big team. Again, we were working with uh, a couple of our 
uh, friends and colleagues from the mudlarkers. Um, I should note as well that this area is now part of an exclusion zone, so please don't attempt to recreate this image or in the background you will see. In fact, I can see the police in the background of that image. That is the police boat. <laughs> um, so the, the, that is actually an accurate representation of what will happen if you go to this site. Um, so what are we doing down uh, at the uh, Victoria Tower Gardens foreshore in August 2013? Uh, we were recording the uh, evidence for a World War II uh, bomb damage to the River Wall, um, very, very close to the Houses of Parliament, and a subject that is explored in detail uh, in Gus's chapter in the book that uh, Elliot has mentioned on numerous occasions. Um, we were looking at this uh, amazing collection of uh, medieval work stones. So if you notice where the bomb strike is, uh, just, oh no, that doesn't work, just here, this is the bomb damage. The foreshore in front of it, you can see, is littered with um, masonry, pieces of stone that have basically been blown out from behind the river wall. So behind the river wall is a, is a piece of made ground, it's a park. And they seem to have created the park by backfilling with masonry bits and pieces from the surrounding area, including a beautiful collection of uh, medieval work stones. So potentially material that has come from uh, the medieval Westminster Palace, all recorded by uh, the frog and interpreted by James Wright, our colleague at Museum of London Archaeology. Uh, note also the ashtray just uh, lurking in the corner there. Um, there's some good evidence for uh, activity in the immediate vicinity, largely comprised around eating and drinking. Um, the, the, the MPs and the, the Lords in the Houses of Parliament, they're not particularly tidy lot. Um, this is just one morning's uh, gathering of uh, artefacts. They are chucking stuff out the window uh, in greater or lesser quantities. Um, and they're very careless as well uh, with, their, with, their, uh, their, with their equipment. So uh, this is the Black Rod Stairs uh, radio, which we did hand in, I should add. We, did, we didn't keep it. We gave it back and said, you might be missing this had you noticed that you haven't got a radio. So at number four is this picture. So we have uh, Elliot, Jeff, Helen and Assad. Uh, and I think that's Margaret and Selina in the background there, uh, cleaning um, on the foreshore at, again, we're back at the City of London, we're at uh, Red Bull Wharf, so just near Cannon Street Railway Bridge. And this is the fourth most uh, popular picture in our archive. Now, I don't know whether the words Red Bull being associated with this image may have something, again, to do with the fact it's appearing in searches a lot. Um, but what I particularly like is it shows an activity that we are all, uh, as frog members, uh, very familiar with, which is cleaning on the foreshore, which to an outsider probably looks pretty bonkers. Um, I also think, uh, having looked through this, that we should probably be thinking about getting some kind of sponsorship uh, from a bucket company. Um, <laughs> because buckets are, as you will see, uh, very prominently displayed uh, in all of our photographs of cleaning on the foreshore. So um, moving round this image, we have uh, Gus cleaning a very rarely uh, uh, seen boat on the uh, custom house foreshore. We have a frog group cleaning at uh, Wapping in front of the town of Ramsgate uh, public house. We've got a group in uh, Brentford cleaning the remains of a, uh, Elliot will have to remind me the date of the, uh, a naval pinnace. Um, at Brentford, and at the top we've got uh, a group hard at work on the Tower of London foreshore. So cleaning and recording are the, the two key activities that uh, come up in our sort of flicker search. And again, the, the buckets are pretty prominent in the recording images as well. Um, so yeah, sponsorship from a bucket company would be a good one. So uh, we're all over Greater London in these pictures, starting with Isleworth in the uh, top corner here, busy scene again at the Tower of London um, and at Greenwich and over in Charlton near the Thames Barrier at the far end. So pictures of, um, of cleaning, recording, 
uh, archaeologists at work are a very popular uh, sort of theme within the Flickr archive. It should be added as well as, the, as a person who has taken a lot of these pictures, it can be quite difficult when everyone is bending over to, <laughs> to not take pictures of your sort of rear view. So I do apologise if over the years I have taken pictures that feature your, your, your posterior, um, and particularly apologise if they've ended up on the front cover of a book. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, I mean, it's a spectacular photo. The, the whole uh, image there is a spectacular photo, bottoms included. At number three is an image we've already seen this morning, um, which is fantastic. Now, this is a photograph that was taken again, I think this is in about 2013 actually originally taken, uh, on the foreshore at uh, Fulham, with a, a, a number of you are here uh, in the audience today, so you may, you may recognize yourselves in this image. Um, and as Elliot said, this is a, a, a very large fragment of Anglo-Saxon 10th century waterwork surviving in situ on the foreshore, so possibly the remains of a, a collapsed uh, fish trap hurdle, or maybe put down as some kind of foreshore consolidation. When it's, it's not entirely clear what the, the function of it is. What is clear, however, is how fantastic uh, the frog members are at outlining a feature. Um, <laughs> it is an excellent thing, um, and amply well displayed here by the Fulham frog. Um, another quick example, uh, here are the frog on the Isle of Dogs. Uh, in this case, uh, Burrell's Wharf, uh, helpfully outlining a uh, bomb strike to the uh, slipway of the, great, the SS Great Eastern. So the, uh, the frog you can see are ringing uh, the area of bomb damage there. Also time team. Also time team. Number two is this one. Um, so this is Deptford Creek, um, photo, it's, it's the earliest Thames discovery photograph in our top 10. So the 1977 photos feature uh, prominently in the top 10. This is the first sort of TDP, the oldest TDP photo that features in our top 10 and features highly at number two. Um, Taken in March 2009, and I, it, I actually have, this is my only visit to uh, Deptford Creek. I haven't been back uh, to revisit since this photograph was taken. Um, it's a, I'm, I'm really interested to see this one so high up in our countdown. It's not a site that we uh, work at. It's not a site that we, we visit regularly. Um, the, the walks, if you haven't done a, a walk down Deptford Creek, the Creekside Trust do amazing guided walks at low tide in Deptford Creek. I highly recommend them. Um, and it is fantastic to see, it's a very, it's quite a dramatic image, so I've, maybe that's the reason that it has been uh, very popular. Now actually on this uh, particular foreshore walk, I was accompanied by uh, a, a tadpole, uh, our earliest uh, tadpole, who is again in the room with us today, and during the afternoon, uh, after we'd done uh, our walk, the tadpole was free uh, to roam with the camera. So we have some uh, fantastic <laughs> images uh, of what an eight-year-old uh, saw at Deptford Creek. Um, so we've got a pair of boots here, and some nice textures uh, going on there. Um, and this picture, um, which is one of my favorite uh, pictures in our archive, actually, and was on a, we had it on a postcard um, for a while. So maybe again a, a future project for our tadpole teams to get out there with their with their phone cameras and, and start taking some pictures of, of things that they notice while they're out on the foreshore or when they're back up on the waterfront. So we're at number one. Can you wait to see what it is? It is this. <laughs> I think the reason that this image has nearly 2,000 views is that Elliot looks at it every day. <laughs> <laughs> I can only assume. Um, this is the number one most viewed photograph in our uh, Flickr archive. It, and it has been for years, actually. It's been consistently there at number one for many, many years now. Um, 
It is one of the uh, ballast barges at Tripcock Ness that Elliot uh, mentioned earlier. It is to my eternal shame that the scale in the image is not quite in the right place, <laughs> which annoys me every time I look at it. Um, but it is, it, again, it's, it's fascinating, the most viewed image uh, in our archive, and this should make Elliot's heart very glad, which it does, is a ship, uh, or a boat. Is it a ship or a boat? boat? It's a boat. It's a boat. Right, I should know that. Um, and again, entirely appropriate that in uh, TDP's 10th year, they have revisited uh, the site to do monitoring and recording of these uh, incredible uh, features, these incredible vessels that are on the foreshore. Incredibly bad vessels, they are awful. <laughs> so that is our, our top 10 uh, countdown. Now it wouldn't be top of the pops unless there was some audience participation. So dancing, no, I don't mean dancing, honestly. But what I would like to do is get you all um, up and moving. Uh, how am I doing for? OK. Um, just before uh, we have lunch. So we've got a little bit of um, standing. So what I'd like to do um, is that I would like everyone who is a, uh, a frog member um, to stand, if that's OK. Excellent. Um, I'd also like. Anyone who has ever been on a, on a guided walk uh, with us on the foreshore to stand up. I would like anyone who has ever been to a Thames Discovery Programme lecture to stand up. I would like anyone who has read about us on the internet or in a magazine or seen us on television to stand up. And I would like uh, anyone who's, this is their first event uh, with the Thames <laughs> uh, to which you are most welcome uh, to stand up. If you are joining us for the first time, um, we welcome you. So I just wanted to say, uh, you are the people who make the Thames Discovery Programme what it is, your support, your enthusiasm, uh, your willingness to, <laughs> to, uh, to be involved in everything that we do, and I think you should give yourselves a standing ovation. Happy birthday, Thames Discovery.